let's see how well we're doing at putting the book of Romans in our heart. So where do you find the key verses for the book of Romans? Chapter one, verses 16 and 17. Let's see how we're doing here. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Yes, very good. Okay, and then as we got to Romans 8, we found another key verse to add. Let's go through verses one and two. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Amen. So here we are right now in chapter 10. We're starting chapter 10 today, right in the middle of Paul's portion of his letter to the Romans, where he discusses the sovereignty of God. And although the church in Rome is comprised primarily of Gentiles, there are some believing Jews. And Paul wants to be sure they understand the value of being an Israelite. Their genealogy isn't what provides right standing with God. But God has a special role for Israel, and he's not done with Israel. So Paul carefully reveals his heart for his people in chapter 9, and then methodically tries to explain how Israel fits into God's purpose and plan by going through examples from the patriarchs, Moses, and the prophets. And bear in mind, these believing Jews have a tremendous opportunity if they grasp Paul's message, for they would then be equipped to explain to the Jews who haven't believed in Christ the truth about salvation and entering the kingdom of God. So let's dig in by reading the first 10 verses of Romans 10. All right. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them and that's looking back to the end of chapter nine, we see he's talking about the Jew. My prayer for them is for their salvation. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness, which is based on law, shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks thus. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Now, take just a moment to observe a couple of things quickly. Do you see any similarity in how Paul begins chapter 10 with how he began chapter 9? Did he not start off with the same burden that he has to, for, to see his countrymen receive salvation? That's really how he starts. He wants to be abundantly clear that he is motivated by a heart of love for his fellow Jew. But we know what the primary obstacle is that the Jew faced in understanding true salvation. What was it? What was the Jew trusting in? What? His own self-righteousness, right? Look at verse three. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. 
So consequently, I think it is pretty important that we make sure we clearly understand what Paul is teaching when he says that he prays for their salvation. So we're going to do something a little different today. Instead of going verse by verse through this passage, I want us to consider the passage as a whole. And I want to ask you this question. Can someone accept Jesus as Savior while denying him as Lord and actually be saved. Have you thought about that? Okay. Now, before you answer, let me ask you this. Have you ever heard someone's testimony where maybe they said something like this? Well, I was saved as a child, but I didn't make Jesus Lord of my life until I was 30. You ever heard somebody say something like that? Okay. So here's the question that I want us to be sure we know how to answer. Can you truly be saved and gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven if you willfully refuse? Oh, did you pass out? I'm sorry, the handouts. Okay. If you willfully refuse to yield, first of all, to Jesus' lordship over your life, okay, can you be saved and gain entrance into heaven if you willfully refuse to yield to Jesus' lordship over your life? Here's the second thing. If you willfully refuse to yield in obedience to his commandments, the things that you know he's spoken, if you refuse to obey those things. And then here's a third way to look at this and think about it. If you willfully refuse to, uh, to yield your will to his. So we're going about this from a little different perspective. Um, and I think it is so critical that we have a clear understanding of how to present the gospel message accurately in order to be sure that we don't mislead anybody accidentally by giving an incomplete gospel or not, or maybe not understanding it fully ourselves. So let's first look at the question, what is salvation? All right. What is salvation? Now, if you go in the Greek, there are two primary words used in reference to salvation. The first is soteria, which is a noun, the noun form, and it denotes deliverance or preservation from something. It frequently includes a future aspect in the New Testament describing the blessings and the benefits that believers will enjoy in the eternal kingdom of God, okay? So that's one word that is often translated as salvation, soteria. The other word is a verb, and it is sozo, and it conveys the idea of being rescued from perishing, and that would include being rescued from the lake of fire, okay? So these are the two primary Greek words that we see translated as saved or as salvation. So I want us to look at a few passages. I've put some verses on your note sheet. If you have a note sheet, we're going to go through. Hopefully there's a little space that if you have anything you want to jot down that we talk about, you've got room to do that. So it's kind of Bible races today. Um, we're going to be flipping around a lot. Let's look at Matthew 1 verse 21. Matthew 1, verse 21. Now, this is, and here we are getting close to the holiday season. It won't be long till we be looking at Advent. And in fact, Ron and John and I are looking at something kind of different. As Once we finish Romans 11, we're going to take a little break and we're going to look at something different uh, from the perspective of the Christmas story. And so we've got a couple of passages here related to the Christmas story in Matthew 1, 21, when the angel appeared to Joseph to tell him that he should still take Mary as his wife, despite the fact that she was with child, he said, and she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. All right, now notice what the people are being saved from. What does it say? Their sins, okay? Now, let's look at Luke. Let's go to chapter two, verses 10 and 11. 
And the angel said to them, this is talking to the shepherds, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. All right. So I want us to look at another Greek word. The word for Lord is kurios. Kurios in the Greek. Listen to a few facts about this word. It is used in the New Testament in 717 passages. <laughs> Kurios. 717 passages use that word. And it's used about 400 times in reference to when we are told to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The word itself denotes authority and rulership. And as an interesting observation, the word for savior is used alone without the word Lord only 24 times in the New Testament. And it's used only in reference to those who are already saved, not in reference to those needing to come to salvation. Interesting. Here's another interesting fact. When the Old Testament was translated into Greek, the Septuagint, the most holy name for God, we would say Yahweh, Y-W-H-W, was translated as kurios. It is interesting to note that that translation alone shows Jesus is God by use of this word. Okay, so follow me as we try to tie these pieces together to gain a clearer picture of true salvation. Listen to Jesus' words in John 8, verses 34 through 36. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. And the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. <laughs> if therefore the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. What is Jesus telling the Jews that he, the son, shall free them from? Slavery to sin. Okay. Now, let's look at Acts 26 verses 14 through 18. And I want you to listen to Paul's testimony that he gives to King Agrippa. And then we had all, and when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will appear to you, delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by me in faith or by faith in me. Sorry. All right. Now, notice Jesus didn't just stop at saying they would receive forgiveness of sins, but he also stated they have been sanctified by faith in him. And what does it mean to be sanctified? To be transformed, to be set apart, to be made holy. Salvation is not merely forgiveness of sins, but it's deliverance from sin's power to a life of faith. Circle back to verse 17 in Romans 1. But the righteous man shall live by what? By faith. Okay. Anytime you've got a question, comment, please speak up. Because I just kind of want us to go through, I realize for most of us, this is one of those very familiar things, but I think it's important enough. We want to make sure we're not missing out on some really key, important facts um, as, as we try to nail this down. 
So let's go to the next question. What is faith? All right. And we need to understand in a nutshell, you might say that faith is taking God at his word. All right. Specifically, what does Romans 10, 17 say? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay. So that kind of explains where it's, it, it's got to come from the word of God. You've got to hear it. And then we're going to take God at his word. Amen. All right. So here are two primary words translated as faith in the New Testament. All right. The first one is the noun form pistis, which means to have a firm persuasion or a conviction based on hearing. That's pistis. Noun form. Okay. The verb form is pistuo. And pistuo means to place confidence in. And because it's a verb, what do you think that implies? Action. Exactly. It's not a mere intellectual acknowledgement, but it's reliance on something. Okay. There is an action involved. Now, there are three main elements of faith, we might say. All right. And here's the first one. You could say it's a firm conviction producing a full acknowledgement of God's truth. All right. I'm going to say that one more time. Three elements, main elements of faith. It's a firm conviction producing a full acknowledgement of God's truth. It's not a wishy-washy thing. You own it. You, you got, you've got it in your heart. And that's acknowledgement, not knowledge. There's a difference. There's a difference. We don't have a full knowledge in the beginning. We learn more as we grow. Amen. Thank you for, for pointing that out, Ron. That's so important. Yeah, we're not going to understand it all ever on this side of eternity. We're going to grow in our knowledge the longer that we walk in faith with the Lord. But initially, it's that acknowledgement that I'm putting my confidence in you. Okay? Look at number two. It involves a personal surrender to him. Faith involves a personal surrender to him. If you acknowledge who he is, does it make sense that you're going to refuse to surrender to whatever it is he wants from your life? That's not faith if you refuse to surrender. So a personal surrender to him. And then the last thing is a conduct that is inspired by that surrender. In other words, it's not enough to have the intellectual assent that I, and I acknowledge who you are, but you also have to surrender, which means there's going to be a difference in your conduct. Okay. Any comments or questions? We good with that? All right, so I want us to look at a couple of passages in Romans that will hopefully help us relate faith to salvation a little bit. So let's go to Romans 1, verses 4 and 5, and here's what it says. It's referencing Jesus when we pick up in verse 4, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Does Paul say the Gentiles need to just say, I believe in Jesus to be saved? Is that what he just said? What did he say that he was to bring about in the Gentiles? Obedience. obedience of faith there you go so he's explaining that look at romans 16 verses 25 and 26 this is as paul is pronouncing his benediction over the church in rome at the end of this letter he says now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of jesus christ According to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now it's manifested 
and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith. Okay? It should be clear that salvation is not mere forgiveness of sin, but an act of God that delivers man from sin's dominion. Salvation deals with the whole issue of sin, not just with sins of the past. It brings deliverance from the cause of sin within man. Okay? You good so far? You ready for it? Yeah. My friend is, is having conversations with her daughter, mm -hmm. and her daughter believes that once she's saved, she doesn't sin anymore. Uh, and so because mom sins, believes that she still sins, she thinks mom's going to hell. So they're, 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 they're studying and they're going back and forth and they're having conversations. And so all of this, I'm like, because I keep telling her, I keep trying to just come see, come see, come listen. Um, so, so she's struggling with trying to help her daughter understand I feel like the difference is what we call sin and what they call sin, you know, because there's certain things that's like, well, don't you ever have a, like a bad thought? And she's like, no. Well, <laughs> yeah, she might need to be a little more self-aware. Uh, but I, I, and I, and the key here and, and Ron, you help out if, if we need to develop this more, but I think what we're, what we're going to be addressing with this, we're never going to be delivered from sin in that nobody reaches a point where you just never sin again. I mean, we're, we're human and we, and we are going to sin again, but the difference is are you living a lifestyle, a habit a, a continual pattern of sin because you're still in that old man. You've never been regenerated. You do not have the Holy Spirit in you and you're just being controlled by whatever it is that desire that the old man is. I believe that. I believe that and I, I agree with that. If she struggles to say no. How, how would you add on that? Add to it first on one that. You know, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us all righteousness. That's he's not talking to unbelievers. That's true. Right? He's writing to believers, acknowledging that we will continue to sin because we have a fleshly nature, and I, we'll never be set free from the fleshly nature until we're glorified, until we get to heaven. You know, and that's why I love what Paul says. Why? There are times when I don't do what I should Roman do, seven. and I do what I shouldn't do. You know, a wretched man that I am, he says. Well, he's saying, I'm still struggling with it. And here's Paul, the super apostle, the writer of the majority of all of, of the New Testament, who himself acknowledges that he struggles with his fleshly nature <laughs> to do what God wants him to do. So here's an example of someone who is obviously saved, okay, right. and obviously used by God, and yet he still struggles. And so we're going to struggle with that. You know, so basically what's happened is yeah. you've been listening to somebody's false teaching. The, you know, I mean, I'm mean, that's just, you know that, because this didn't just come into her mind on her own self. She's read that. She's heard that yeah. from somebody. And yeah, and so she's, she, that's what she's believing, because that's what her teacher or her mentor or whoever is saying. But scripture very you know, did, you know, shows that we still continue to sin. Now, our sin is forgiven even before we commit it and after we commit it. But that confessing of sin has to do with our relationship, our daily relationship with God. You know, when we confess our sin, we're not we're not struggling with it. Because when we sin, you know, devil's always there. See, you're not much of a Christian or you're not a Christian at all. You wouldn't have done that. He's accusing us, okay. And that we're being told, oh, no, no, you're young, but it re restores that relationship. So there's a, another verse that helps with that. I it, believe she used that yeah. with Paul, you know, I believe yeah. she yeah. used that and stuff. And the biggest problem for her is, it's not the daughter, but the mother, is that my daughter makes them go to hell. It makes their daughter sad, yeah. you know, because that's what yeah. the daughter well, is, is a believer, too, that, you know, one of the blessings of the Holy Spirit is, 
he will convict us when we sin. When, when we're in sin, the Holy Spirit will come upon us and convict us of our sin to draw us back. You know, Scripture also says he disciplines those he loves. Mm -hmm. uh, when we sin, there will be consequences for our sin. But he loves us and the Holy Spirit will move on us and draw us back to where we're seeking Jesus and not in the flesh. And there's a difference between conviction and guilt. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. The Holy Spirit brings conviction, which is designed to bring us to confess yes. and receive that one virtue on one night, that cleansing. The devil will will try to lay guilt on us right. like you're really not you're not Christian or you're not a yeah. very good Christian or whatever right. thing that he will do. So the difference is between guilt and conviction. So <clears throat> along those lines, let's move into a discussion of what is sin. How's that for a nice segue? All right. So, Holy Spirit's at work here, huh? All right. So the Greek word for sin is hamartia. And it's often defined, have you heard somebody tell you that sin means missing the mark? You heard that before, which is kind of an, an archery reference. It makes sense. Although it's not a bad definition, I think it might be helpful to better explain what it means when you miss the mark God's called you to hit. Sin means you're walking your own way. You are denying God's right to rule over your life, okay? You've missed the mark if you're the one who's ruling over your life. And at its very core, don't we see that this is what the original sin was in Genesis 3? I mean, I, I want you to think about this for a minute. When Satan tempts Eve to eat of the fruit, she responded by saying to him that God said, you shall not eat from it or touch it lest you die. Now, first of all, she either misquoted God or she was misinformed by Adam. Nevertheless, if that's what she believed that the command of God was, think about what happened next. Satan replied with, you surely shall not die for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Satan basically points out that if she were to eat of the fruit, she wouldn't need God to tell her the difference between good and evil because she would know it for herself. That original sin was simply man deciding he could rule his own life instead of following God's rule over his life. So sin is self's rulership. My will, my way, my evaluation, my estimation, my opinion against what God says. Look at Isaiah 53, 6. I'm sure many of you can quote this with me. What does it say? All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Amen for that. Now, we know that this nature of sin is inherent to each one of us because of the fall. No one has ever been born without the natural tendency to be his own boss or go his own way. Look at some ways in which sin is manifested. If we turn to Romans 14, 23, let me just give you a few examples. Paul is giving instructions regarding disputes over what is permitted to eat or drink. And he concludes with these instructions in verse 23. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. Okay. In other words, whatever you do should be in response to obedience to what God has told you to do. Otherwise, you're acting in sin when you, you just choose to go your own way. This is what I've decided is okay. Look at 1 John 3, 4. All right. Everyone who practices sin and notice that word practice, that's that habitual lifestyle. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. If you practice sin, you're refusing to submit to what God has said. That makes you lawless. 
Okay. First John 5, 17 says all unrighteousness is sin. All right. Let's look at one more reference. Turn to James 4, verses 13 through 17. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we shall go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. Think about the people living in Israel 10 days ago. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord's will, if the Lord wills, we shall live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Okay, ultimately, sin is rebellion against God's authority or lordship over your life. So, what is the result of sin? Romans 6.23 says what? The wages of sin is death. And we know this has been the case all the way back to Genesis 3. Adam and Eve didn't experience a physical death the day they ate of the fruit, although the dying process began in their physical bodies. But what kind of death took place? Spiritual. There was a separation from God. And since the issue of sin is not one that can be overlooked by God and it's caused separation between us and God, what does it take to be free from sin? Well, we have to be delivered from that which produces sin. So follow-up question, what produces sin in us? Or what is the source of sin within us? What do you think? You know, that's always my tendency to want to respond with that. But I want to throw something out that's a little bit different. The actual source that produces sin within us is really our old man, okay? And here's why I want to be careful not to refer to it as the flesh, because that's really the vehicle for sin, not the source. Think about that for a minute, okay? The old man is the one that causes our body to be an instrument of sin. Look at Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. The old man is the one that keeps us in slavery to sin. And so if you remember when we studied this before, the phrase done away with is the Greek word katargeo, which means rendered inoperative or made powerless, okay? In other words, you have had the power source cut when you are crucified with Christ and become a new creature, all right? So the struggle is not so much between is the old man. Is he still alive in you, the old man? Yeah. yeah. Well, well he's still he, it's, it's kind of a picture to me that we have the power to resurrect him. <laughs> really. I mean, we, our flesh has died, but I mean, you know, you know we've died to say we're a new creature, but there's still a sense that he can be resurrected in us in, in a way. Wouldn't you call it a sin nature? Yeah. Yeah. It, this, we, this, have a sin nature. we have a sin have nature. He's 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 got it. We're 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 good. That sin nature is still there. And and in that respect, and that's where I think our flesh comes in. Yes, we still have. Yeah, we cannot that. lose our salvation. We cannot lose. But, and, but I want you to see. Remember, if it's the old man, the old man is a slave to sin. If you are a new creature, are you still a slave to sin or have you already been delivered from that? And there's a power source that you can tap into who's already residing in you that will enable you to be delivered from slavery to sin. You see what I'm saying? 
Exactly. You'd be a slave to Jesus instead of sin. Now, it doesn't mean that you never sin, but it means you have the ability to no longer be a slave to sin. Now, in reference to that, can we decide that we don't want to tap into the power source and kind of choose to satisfy the flesh for a period of time? That's And that's the idea of that sin nature. The difference is if it's still the old man, the old man is a slave to it. He can't be delivered from it. Okay. So, it, it, and I realize we're kind of wading through some deep concepts here. Yeah. Uh, there's a scripture in Galatians 5, mm -hmm. a, a verse that says, it, I think it's the freedom of Christ that sets you free and burn them so that you won't be enslaved again to that uh, sin nature that we've been talking about. We've been talking about. So we don't have to live as if we're not free. It's Amen. That we have that old man trying to uh, influence how we think, how we work. And it all goes back to having Jesus Christ as Lord mm -hmm. of your life. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That, that he's got to be Lord. Yeah. Well, and if he is, and you're sinning. The Holy Spirit's just yeah. hammering away at it. <laughs> you're going to be miserable. He's going to be miserable. Into submission, going, okay. Exactly. And he does that because he loves us. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. That, what's that Greek word for the katergeo? That means, I'm sorry, I should have put that up there. To be done away with, when it talked about that our old man has been done away with back in Romans 6 6. Okay, that's the word. That that's the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know a fellow that. He was apostolic Pentecostal, but he was also an alcoholic. And so he'd go six months at a time without drinking, and maybe in the church, he'd start drinking it for a while, and then he'd just come in, well, I'm going to go to hell. So he'd go back to church, and he'd quit drinking. And he struggled with that for years. And the ultimate price was he was diabetic, and was, he ended up dying from the alcoholism, and he was killed him as a result of diabetes. But he still his his what he struggled with was not something I struggled with. Mm -hmm. But we're all addicted to whatever our sin nature is, and and so you know he knew he was doing wrong. Yeah. But he just you know he would still go back and forth, and he would be he'd be in church, heavy in church. Everybody's going to hell if you don't be baptized in the name of Jesus and. And then he would stop and buy six pack of beer and then he would wait until work. I had a friend like that that was a Jehovah Witness. And, and, and you know, and the reality is we each have tendencies that are going to be our particular struggle that they're all different. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's very true. Um, and, and that's why, why we, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, why we need to be careful. We show grace to each other. And, and here's the reality of it, because you will have some people who will want to debate. Was that man saved? Was that man not saved? Just looking at the circumstances. What's the accurate answer to that question? God, God, God. God knows. God knows his heart. That's an issue between him and God. And that's not for me to decide. Okay. My role is to take myself and examine myself to see if I'm really in the faith and let the Holy Spirit reveal that to me. And I'm to pray for those that I see that are in struggles because that's a big part of what we do. We lift one another up and we encourage one another. And so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think we need to be very clear that we don't miss the mark and go around this thing and think, oh, now I know how to go decide this or this or this. That's not what the point is, is for us to be sure we understand clearly what salvation, what is genuine faith, what is sin, and make sure when we do deliver a gospel message that we're doing it effectively. Look I mean, at Hebrews. Well, oh, go ahead. We don't struggle with other people. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, we all have yeah. our own struggle. Yeah. And, and so it's it's hard not to be judgmental. It's like, okay, I'm not an alcoholic, but I have this struggle, or you have that struggle. I, I haven't stopped thinking about those cinnamon rolls back there. <laughs> Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah. So let's look at Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15. Since then the children share in flesh and blood, 
he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Through what happened in the Garden of Eden, Satan placed us in slavery to sin, which gave him the power of death. Jesus broke this bondage by his death. So we can't break the bondage, but Jesus can. Okay. So as we try to assimilate all of this into a more complete understanding of salvation, can we agree? It must involve a denial of self and embracing the cross of Jesus Christ. Read Mark 8, 34 through 38 with me. Okay. And he summoned the multitude with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels shall save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels. Do you see what happens at salvation? You turn from that independent, I want to make my own decisions about what is good and evil creature, who's been walking your own way into a new creature that God had intended before the fall back in the garden of Eden. One who is in submission to God as ruler over your life. If there's no denial of self, no following him, there's no salvation. So the point of trying to develop this today is to be sure we understand how important it is to deliver a clear presentation of the gospel when witnessing to others. There are some who try to present a gospel message of cheap grace that never addresses a life of surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ as a requirement of salvation. And if you only tell someone that asking Jesus uh, to forgive him of his sins is all you have to do to be saved, you're not really presenting the true gospel message. And you've honestly done more, more harm than good if you lead others to believe that they're saved, if nothing has changed in their life other than saying a few words or walking down the aisle. Repentance is a missing element in many gospel presentations. And we want to be sure we don't mislead others in understanding the truth about salvation. So here's the definition for repentance. It means to turn away from self and turn to God. It is a clear change in the direction of your life where you're no longer going your own way. You've turned and you're now going God's way. Look at these verses regarding repentance. Luke 15, 7, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Luke 15, 10, in the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Listen to the end of the story of the prodigal son after he squandered his inheritance and finally came to his senses. Luke 15, 18. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. We see repentance in the heart of the son. What was the message John the Baptist preached? Look at Matthew 3, 2. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then after Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been taken into custody, we see in Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. All right. We're going to turn over to Luke 14, and I want us to look at verses 25 through 33. Now, great multitudes were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, what is Jesus saying is required to be his disciple or one who is saved? Say it again. You're going to have to turn from that. And really, you can't place anything above him, right? You can't have any other relationships that are more important. You can't follow your own passions. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and take counsel whether he's strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one who is coming against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Jesus is saying we have to understand there is a cost. Don't offer cheap grace. There is nothing cheap about what Jesus did on the cross. All right? So... In essence, what we're saying is that we are not under, uh, we, we can't be in control of our own lives, all right? We are not qualified to be in control of our own lives, that we have to acknowledge God is the one who is in control. So if we look at Romans 10, verses 9 through 10, and this very familiar passage that we use to share the gospel with others, I want you to see if you recognize all the elements we've discussed today in these verses, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So if you confess with your mouth, Jesus as Lord, kurios, who's the ruler over your life? There you go. Who is your curios? It must be Jesus, not you. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what does that signify? What do you have? Faith. faith, exactly. Specifically, faith in God's word and faith in God's power. Do you see repentance in there anywhere in those verses? Well, think about it this way. Look at confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And the Greek word for confess is this. And I'll butcher this one, I know. Homologeo. And it means to say the same thing as another. To agree with. To not deny. If you're in agreement about who is Lord over your life, doesn't this indicate it that you've repented from walking your own way? I mean, you can't have it both ways. Either you're your own Lord or Jesus is your Lord. All right. So as we close today, I want us to finish up by looking at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, verses 21 through 27. And we know when Jesus preached this sermon, there were some radical concepts for the Jews to try to comprehend. He has turned everything upside down about what they believed about themselves and about the law. So here's how he concludes. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Stop. Did you catch that? It isn't enough to call him Lord, but obedience is the requirement. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons? And in your name, perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Were these people necessarily doing bad things when they were casting out demons and all the other things? Not at all. So how is it he didn't know them? What do you think? Yeah, no relationship. He wasn't, they weren't doing those things because God had told them to do it. They had their own motives. They wanted to be seen for their good works. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them 
may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and burst against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and burst against that house. And it fell and great was its fall. Now, who's the rock? Jesus, if you build your life on the solid rock, it means you've seen that walking your own way and it, you've seen that that's what you were doing and you've realized that you were acting as an illegitimate owner because you aren't qualified to run your own life. And no matter how hard you try to do a good job, you still will miss the mark. So you have confessed your sinfulness before holy God and repented of walking your own way. You've believed in faith that Jesus is God's only son who came to live on this earth as someone who was fully man, yet fully God. And only through his sinless life that was sanctified and sacrificed on the cross have your sins been paid. In faith, you have buried that old man and you've been raised to a new life in Christ by the power of the cross. And only faith is what pleases God. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, which now resides in you as a seal of the promise of your future redemption, are you able to be free from the power of sin in your life? And that's the message of salvation. Freedom, not just from sin's penalty, but freedom also from sin's power. And then one day from sin's presence. So can you share this gospel message with a world who desperately needs the truth of the gospel. Yes. Amen. I pray we all can embrace that and understand. Comments, questions? Okay. What do you think? How would you answer the question? Is it possible?